Good morning, everyone. We are in Perek Chofhe, chapter 25 of Sefer Yeshayahu. Perek Chofhe has four parts to it. It's a short Perek. It's only 12 psukim long. The beginning actually sounds like Tehillim. And it's a, it's a Tehillim, actually, it's a kind of mizmor, a song that Yeshayahu is singing to HaKadosh Baruch, who really sounds very much like the language of Tehillim. Starting from Pasuk Vav, we then talk about an, a feast that's going to be thrown in the future. We don't know. On the one hand, there are those who say, and uh, this is the position of Schwab takes this position, the Dat Mikra. I, I was looking for a, um, a medieval commentator who would do the same, but I wasn't able to find it. But I also, but they take it in a very positive sense that this feast that's going to be described in Vav, Zion, and Chet is almost like the kind of feast that was thrown at Har Sinai when people accepted God. It's going to be the acceptance of God by the other nations. However, the classic commentators who you find in the Mikrot Gedolot view this feast very differently. It's a setup. Uh, it is a setup that it's going to um, weaken the nations of the world. By the way, they're going to be fed. They're going to be overfed. It's going to be like uh, the post-Thanksgiving feeling. For all of them on steroids at the same time. Posuk Tet, then we get into is going to be another famous statement of, of thanks to God. And then Yud, Yud Aleph and Yud Bet is going to be talking about Moab, the downfall, the belittling of Moab themselves. And Moab may be just representative of all of the nations as well. And so let's get started with the opening of the Pasuk. <laughs> Aleph, excuse me a minute. Hashem Elokayata, excuse me. Hashem Elokayata, you God, our my God. Now, interestingly, just from this language, the fact that it's personal, it's in, a, in first person, according to the Ibn Ezra, this is really a private prayer of Yeshayahu. But then we turn into Aromimcha Odeshimcha. I will greatly, I will highly, I will elevate, and I will th praise your name. Rav Schwab points out here that we notice that there's a switch from calling God, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, God by name, to talking about God's name. And he makes a comparison to Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. Normally, when we hear a tefillah, you'll hear the Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. What does that mean? Blessed be him and blessed be his name. So Rav Schwab explains that there's no way that a human being could actually understand God. And if you can't really understand God, you can't really bless him. But God's names are always attributes of our interaction with God. We've been talking about Svakot in previous chapters, where God is viewed as the host of the army, as the power. You talk about God as the Yudke Vavke, as the Rachamim. You talk about Elohim as the sense of judgment. And so it's possible for a person, according to this, to not just bless God, but also to bless his name is the way we really can interact. And that might be, says, why we have both the idea of the Baruch Hu Uvaruch Shemo, but also why we have here, we start out with Hashem Elokayata, God, you are my God, Aromimcha Odeshimcha, and I will highly praise you, I will praise you greatly, I will lift you up and praise you, your name, but not you, the name. Kiasita Pelam, because you have done niflaot, you've done wonder, a wonder. Now it's in singular. The Ibn Ezra takes the approach that, again, we've seen this before, that many of these prophecies that sound like prophecies of end of days are prophecies that are also understood as the time of the siege of Sancheirev and Yerushalayim. And so according to the Ibn Ezra, we're talking about that this is the downfall of Sancheirev, where miraculously his armies disappear right when it seems like the Jews are going to fall, the, 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 that the siege will um, will succeed and, and, and destroy the Jewish people. The Radak says, no, this is more an end of days prophecy, and it's the time of Gog and Magog. The... Um, that Mikra says, wait a second, this Pella is not an anonymous Pella. We'll see it in the pas in the Pasuk, in the in the coming Pasuk, what the Pella is going to be. And then we say, Etzot Merachok Emuna Omen. And then your plans, Merachok, from far off, from a distant past, is normally the way it's it's uh, translated, are very faithfully fulfilled. 
emuna omen is a double language, and often we find double languages to emphasize the fact. Now, Merachok, the Barbanel says, actually, what do you mean your promises are far off? Well, the promise is far off. According to the Barbanel, go back to the time of Avram Avinu. You've made all of these promises that we're going to be a great nation, that, that anyone who blesses us is going to be blessed, anyone who curses us is going to be cursed. Those promises we're going to be. The Red Ox says in more general terms, all of the prophecies of the prophets until now, okay, they were all fulfilled in that sense. It's also, Merachot, the Dat Mikra has, has a beautiful explanation, and I apologize not giving credit to the person who wrote this, this commentary. This is by Amos Chacham on Yeshayahu. Amos Chacham says that, again, a fascinating personage, we, I think we've dealt with him in the past, Amos Chacham says Merachot could also mean in the heavens. The promises of the heavens have been fulfilled here on the earth. All of that is possible. Now, emuna omen, again, just like we have a repetition, it can be a strengthened term. Interestingly, the dat sofrim, a bit of it suggests that what this is really talking about, emuna omen is caused faith, is the way he translates it. That people, through these wonders that they've witnessed, have, be have begun to believe in God, which is within the theme as well. Samta meir legal. You have transformed cities into piles of stone. Now, what is it, Meir Legal, that which was of cities into stone? Now, according to Rashi, according to the Malbim, we're talking about the fact that cities of the non-Jews were destroyed. Okay, Rashi takes directly the idea that this is Har Seir, Edom, that is right on the boundary of Eretz Yisrael, has made them into, destroyed them entirely. The Malbim says that this is a, a, an immediate kind of destruction. You had a city, and now you have rubble. Uh, if you want to know what cities to rubble look like, just watch the news. You can see that. That's number one. Rev Hirsch, however, takes it differently. And he says, he says it's not talking about the enemies of the Jewish people. It's talking about Yerushalayim. You have taken May. May is not from cities, but portions of Yerushalayim you have destroyed. And what were the portions of Yerushalayim that were destroyed? Those were the portions where the non-Jews had built their temples and other forms of Avodah Zarah. Basically, what it's saying is you want, you've cleansed the city of Yerushalayim in your actions. Kiryabitz vitzura lemapelam. Again, according to the same concept, Kirya, um, Kirya the fortified city has fallen down. Now, fallen down, Rav Schwab follows in the approach of Rav Hirsch, as he does, he does most of the time, not always in his explanation. He says, the walls of Yerushalayim that were built by the non-Jews have fallen down. What you're cleansing Yerushalayim of that non-Jewish piece, Armon Zarim Meir, the palaces of the foreign have been from a city. What is it, from city? So the simple explanation mm -hmm. that the palaces of the cities were destroyed, the, the foreigners, the foreign, foreigners who built their palaces, Yerushalayim, they were destroyed. Rashi, it's as if it says Ba'ir, in the city. The Radak says that this is actually talking not just about um, this the cities in the surrounding areas, but even Rome itself has been destroyed. According to Rav Schwab, Rav Schwab says, you have destroyed those palaces, and he says it's talking about those buildings that have been built on Harabait, the Golden Dome, and also the, the mosque that is up there. They will be destroyed. Le'olam lo yibane, they will never be rebuilt. So if I take Pasuk Bet and I take Pasuk, um, take Pasuk Aleph and Pasuk Bet together with the way the Dat Mikra says that you have done these wonders. One of, one of the wonders you have done, either the downfall of our enemies and the enemies as far away as Rome and as close as those that surround us, Harseir, depending on the commentator you take, or you've been able to purify the city of Yerushalayim from the foreign influences that have invaded the city and defiled the city. al -Kain. Therefore, because of this destruction and the way you have gone about it, 
Yichabducha am az. The powerful nation, the mighty nation, will honor you. The Radak says, very simply, after everyone witnesses the power of God, they're going to start honoring God. The Am'az are the other powerful nations of the world. The Malbim says, no, the Am'az are the Jewish people. After we see the salvation, the Jews will honor you. They hadn't been honoring you in the past. This is going to be a change of attitude. Kiryat goyim aritzim yirauha, the city of the of the nations, of the mighty nations, will be in fear of you. First step, of, of course, is because since we're dealing a poetic structure, the al applies to both half. So it's as if the Pesach was written, al yichabducha am'az, al kiryat goyim aritzim yirauha. Okay, so first just understand the structure. In that same kind of sense, Rav Schwab says, and he says that the Yerushalayim, and this is where he pushes it a little bit. He says, Kiryat Goyim Aritzim, of the mighty nations, he defines the Goyim Aritzim as the, the many Shvatim, as the Jews. It takes it a little compliment, Rav Schwab. I, I might not understand him properly. So I will, you know, obviously Rav Schwab was an Odom Godel. And they're, what, they're all of the varied approaches, let's say, of, which are in Yerushalayim, are going to, at the same time, be in awe of God. So we talk about kavod, honor, and awe. It's much easier, this pasuk, to follow the approach of the medieval commentators of Rashi and Radak and others that were talking in this pasuk as we were in the previous ones of non-Jews. Much easier to do it, but that's the way he has to do it. Because if I take Rav Hirsch's approach, and we're talking about Yerushalayim, that Yerushalayim is going to be purified. Well, I could do Al Kenya Am Az. Now, Am Az, remember, the Malbim says it's the Jews. And it could be Kiryat Goyim Aritzim. I could say the Pesach was going then. I talk about the Jews and I talk about the non Jews. Okay, but the Kiryat, Kiryat, the city of the Goyim, is complicated because we've been talking about Yerushalayim being purified according to that approach. How does that fit in, and how do you set, do it? Yeah, yeah. Also, Yerushalayim is is host to basically two shvatim, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would think Goyim Aritzim would refer to twelve ten tribes that have already been. If it's the time of Kitzkiyahu. But that's not as compl- that's not as complicated. While it's true that Yerushalayim that Yerushalayim was divided between Binyamin and Yehuda, Yerushalayim was an international city. It was a not international. It was a national city, similar to D.C. Lahavdil. Okay, um, in the sense that it didn't belong to Yehuda and it didn't belong to Binyamin. So it does belong to everyone. So that one that one I can deal with. That that I can deal with. The the, the bigger problem I have here is referring in this same pasuk, Am'az, the parallel to the, the mighty nation, is Goyim Aritzim. Are they, normally this refers to the people, okay, um, Agviya is a body, okay, so the, cor- the corpus of the, pow- of the mighty. Now, normally we would talk about other nations, we talk about the Jews, as well as a goy, goyachad ba'aretz, we refer to ourselves. So if I'm using that terminology, goyim aritzim in biblical terms could be goyachad ba'aretz, we are a goy, okay? And if we're a goy, and, and you're plural, then you have all of the shvatim. That can work. It does work. It does work. It does. In modern Hebrew and in modern sensibilities, where we always talk about a goy is someone who is non-Jewish, it's a little more complicated to hear. So I, I, I see where he comes from. I hear where he comes from. It feels a little bit more pushed because to refer to the individual shvatim as goyim is part of the challenge. I think they refer to goyim in other instances too. I just yeah, know okay. But so I can hear it. And also on the singular, so in Yerushalayim, they were all united, whereas goyim, I mean, sim, I could see the 10 tribes. They've been... They had their own portions, but they were at this point, if it's this Kiyahu's time, well, if, uh, he's, again, if he's foreseeing the victory that would happen, 
Right. Chris Jones, I think it was the sixth year or so that they went out and could us in the north. Yeah, so Rev Schwab, but Rev Schwab is not limiting this to his Giao's time. Remember, Rev Schwab is even talking about the mosques on top of Harabait, the mosque on top but of then, who even knows which, which Right, but then but we can talk about the fact that this is, you know, a end of days prophecy, post Gogo Magog prophecy, and a post Gogo Magog tribute to Akodesh Borhu and praise to Akodesh Borhu, where tribes will receive will return and will have identity. Identity once again, which what part of it? I don't know, but that's something the Mashiach comes in and solves a lot of problems. Okay, Pasuk continue and the Psukim continue Pasuk Dalad Ki Hayita Maoz Ladal because you were the um, the uh, Maoz like a fortress for the person who was impoverished Maoz Leevyon a fortress for the one who was in need. The difference, by the way, between a dal and an evyon, Rav Schwab talks about this as well. A dal is a person who is impoverished, doesn't have resources, personal resources. An evyon, he's a person who is doesn't have the ability to live with dignity, doesn't have, and it can be not because of not because of money, lack of money. It can be as well a lack of power. It can be a lack of rights. So the Dal and Avion, while they're parallel in the structure, they are different as well. But Tsarlo, okay, through that Tsar that happens to him, okay, mm-hmm. the protection from the Zerem, a Zerem is um, um, a current. And here it's talking about a rain, a, a powerful rainstorm. Tsel um, Mechorev, like um, shade from a blazing sun. In other words, that all of this is talking about that God is going to be protecting us. He's protecting us from the currents and he's protecting us from the blaze. What are the currents and what are the blaze? Again, according to Rashi, the Zerem, the current, is actually the Ruach Aritzim, is beliefs, is actually the, the foreign beliefs. God has protected us from them. R- Rishwab flips it and he says the Zerim is physical danger and the Tzel, the shade, is we're being provided with protection from the spiritual danger as well. Ultimately, Rav Dad Mikrat takes it a much simpler way and he says, wait a second, blazing sun and torrential rain. God is protecting us all seasons, all the time of the year, both in the winter and in the summer. Words, it means it's a constant, it's another way of saying constant protection as well. Because the spirit of the mighty ones are like a wall of rain that ultimately, they're, they're, it's such a powerful force, these foreigners that they can sweep us away, a wall of rain. We, we talk about, you know, it's like a wall of, of, of showers that are coming down on us. It's such a powerful force that we have to fight against. God is providing us that, that salvation. Kechorev bitzayon. It's like a, um, a um, sweltering heat, like a, uh, a powerful sun in the desert. Bitzayon, sayon comes from the word tziah ushmama. Okay, like see, which is another way of desert or the Sha'on Zarim Tachnia, the noise, the tumult of the foreigners will be brought down. Chorev Bitzel Av. And it's going to be this sun, this powerful sun that are better probably a better way of saying Chorev. It's a scorching heat, okay, that's shaded by a cloud. Zemir Aritzim Ya'anem, the breaking of the mighty, okay, will be, um, will humble them. Ya'anem from the word Inui, uh, an Ani, um, a, a person who's impoverished. There's actually two ways to explain the end of this pasuk. The, f- the first way, which is what I gave just now, we're talking about, in essence, we're going to break down these people. So, you have, for example, that when the the, um, the simple explanation is that God is going to protect us, and the way he's going to protect us, he's going to protect us, it's like scorching heat shaded by a cloud. 
Zemir Aritzim Ya'aneh, the word Zemir in this case is not from the word Zemir. Rashi says it's a, uh, it is cutting off. Lashon Kritam. So the, the, the destruction of the, of the mighty ones, Ya'aneh, will ultimately cause the, that could normally cause impoverishment. Meaning God's going to protect us against everything. That's one way of taking it. Rashi, however, introduces a separate way of translating it. Rashi introduces, he says, wait a second. Ma'ane could be from the word, uh, Ya'ane could be from the word respond, that God is going to get, to, uh, is going to, I'm sorry, is going to respond to us. And also, Zamir doesn't necessarily have to mean to cut off. If I'm uh, Zmira is pruning in, in Hebrew, Zamir could also come from the word song. And if that's the case, the way Rashi would explain it would be that when the non-Jews are singing, then singing what? They're singing their faith in God after what has happened to them. Then God is going to respond to them. Now, I don't know how your English translations translate. How does our school translate the end of that puzzle? Plus, okay, at the end. Scorching heat shaded by a cloud, from the breaking of the mighty and humble. Okay, so that's according to the approach that Zamir is to cut or to break. And that is according to the approach of, ya, of Ya'anan from the word humble, only. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. You have a song? So how does it go? The song of the terrible one. So he takes, so Sansino takes a mixture. He says the song, and it's probably like the victory songs, their sense of, of security, Ya'anan still is from the word to be brought low from the word ani, okay? So he does that that mixture of it. You have, we're not sure exactly what is this is talking about. There's no question, huh? Tic-tac, tic -tac. okay. Well, if, if uh, Rav Schwab knew about Tic-tac, when he was writing his commentary, he may have mentioned it, okay? <laughs> According to Rav Hirsch, this whole idea, by the way, of the, the, the scorching heat in the clouds, he suggests that the destruction, the scorching heat appears suddenly. That it's kind of thing where it's a cloudy day and all of a sudden the clouds break and then you're overwhelmed by the heat. And that's what he and he says that's the way that the destruction of those non-Jews who are oppressing us is going to come about. Okay, yeah. Is is this related to Horev? I don't have to think of the Yushalayim. Uh, Horev is normally uh, Haramoriah. That, that, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, it's Har Sinai. That's not related to this word no no har chorev is you know har chorev har sinai it's huh well it's in the middle of the desert okay har chorev but i don't know why it was called har chorev like i there are midrashim about it but i don't know if it ties it into the heat piece that's the end of the song yeah from the word sia like the word a desert Okay, when you first look at it, you're all ready to read B'tzion in, 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 in Zion, but it's not, it's B'tzion. Okay, we finish now that song of praise. And after you finish the song of praise, we're going to have a few who came about this feast that's taking place. And this feast, again, there were two different approaches on how we can explain it, good and bad. Rashi is going to take the fact that it's bad, and the Datami Kra is going to take that it's good. It's a celebratory feast. And at this mountain, now this mountain is Har Tzion, Yerushalayim. God is going to make, and God of hosts, this is the mighty God, is going to be making for all the nations on this mountain, Mishtesh Manim, Mishtesh Marim. He's going to make for them a feast that is going to feature fatty foods, He's going to give them all a heart attack, according to Rashi, basically. Okay, Mishdesh Marim, he's going to give them a, um, a, a, a feast which features the dregs of the wine. Okay. Shmanim Memuchayim, he's going to have the fatty foods which also have marrow in it. Okay. Shmarim Mizukakim, and it's going to be just the refined dregs itself. Now, what if I take it in a negative sense? This table God is going to set up for them, according to Rashi, at the end of the days, when they think that they've finally made it and they're conquering Yerushalayim and they're there, what's God going to do for them? God is going to give them a big feast. And the feast is going to be the setup. The setup is going to be that number one, they're going to have these fatty foods themselves, and they're going to have ultimately bad things that are things that are bad for them. Step one. 
They're going to eat the foods which have marrow okay, that originally have a really good taste and at the end they hit you. They're going to be drinking the refined um, dregs. Rashi, uh, Radak says, this is just the dregs of the wine which have nothing, uh, even uh, no liquid with it anymore. That's all they're going to get in that. And this is going to be that they're going to be so, the Radak says, this is just trying to give us an example of what's going to be of the, these nations at the end of days. Negative picture. The Datami Kratz flips it completely, and also Rav Schwab goes in the same approach. That this is going to be, in the future, the same kind of feast like there was at Har Sinai. They're going to have a feast here as well. And when we talk about the fatty foods, those were considered good foods. When we talk about Shmarim, it's Yayin Yashan. It's, it's, it's the, the, the well-aged wine, not the blue bottle. It's like good mm -hmm. wine, okay? And when we talk about the shmanim mimuchim, that ultimately these foods, this is the mo the best food that's out there. In fact, the Dat Mikra says one explanation is limchot et atzalachat. It may not be the foods with marrow. It might be the foods that you lick your plate at the end. It's so good. And when it talks about the shmarim mizukakim, it's talking about the cleanest of the aged wine they're going to have. All of that is great because they're going to be at that point celebrating God. Two completely different explanations of this feast itself. And then, uvila bahar hazeh, and then it will be swallowed up, it'll be closed, it'll be ended. Okay, we have, um, in uh, when we talk about um, uh, talking about, about putting away the Aron, Kibalata Kodesh, right? They, when they would cover over the Aron in the times of the Mishkan to transport it, it's like it's, it's swallowed up by the coverings that they would put over. Uvila Bahar Hazem, and God is going to remove in this mountain, Pnei Halot, cover, the covering that's over them. What is Halot Al Kolamim? It's the covering that's over all of the nations. What does it mean? Radak says, remember, this is bad, according to Radak. He says he's going to remove Gog and Magog are going to be end. Gog, the mighty superpower that was protecting all the other nations of the world, has been destroyed. Their cover, their protection has, is going to be move, moved away. According to that Mikra, this is really a good prophecy, meaning that anything that separates the nations from God is going to be removed. They're going to see God directly in the same way. And also the, the mask, which is covering over all of the nations, that all of the, this mask, if it's bad, it's the mask, what has allowed the nations who are not the Jewish people to, to destroy the Jewish people, they thought it was because of them. No, it's because of God's ultimate plan. And there, the agents of that plan is going to be removed. The Masecha, according to the good pieces, again, that which removes them from people. Now, the difference in a Masecha and a Lot, a Lot it provides greater protection. A Masecha provides more personal protection. It's less, think of the word Schach. And then we have a Posuk that's very famous. Bilah Mavet Lanetzach. God will swallow up or will eliminate death forever. Now, Interestingly, the Radak says, this is a postdoc that is said very often at Levias. Okay. The Radak says it doesn't say Bila Mavet Lanetzach, that God will eliminate death, but Bila Hamavet Lanetzach. It's the death. And what is the death? The death of the Jews who are being killed while we're in Galut. God will stop the nations of the world from trying to destroy us. That's the Radak's approach. Okay. Ultimately, the more famous is the al Shimoni. The al Shimoni says, and the Medrash says, that there will be a time when people will stop dying. Okay, And they're going to live as long as the earth lives, which was the original plan uh, at the time of Gan Eden. The Adam and Chava, until they had from the Eid Sadat, there wasn't going to be death. We're going to return to that state. The Dat Mikra is a real interesting explanation of this. And the reason why it, it's fascinating is from a shot perspective, it fits into the Psukim much better. Because we just talked about, according to the Dat Mikra, this wonderful feast that is happening. And we talked about the Jews, the non-Jews coming close to God and all of the things that had separated them from God will disappear. 
Vila Hamavet, therefore, according to the Dat Mikra, is, is that even though the non Jews will see God, they won't be destroyed by it. Now, if you remember back to that puzzle, back when we talk about the way the Aaron was being transported, and they would cover it up, okay, and it says that we shouldn't look Kodesh, when it's being packed up. You should only wait until the Aaron is, is done. That word Bila coming here also is real interesting, that we know that we have to have, uh, there needs to normally be limits between our interaction with God, just like Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, it's told below your any Adam Vachai. No one can see me and continue to live. Just like the Jews had to be away from the mountain. Just like you don't look at the Aaron while it is, is revealed, except for the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippurim. You don't look at it. All of those things. Well, now the non Jews are looking at God. And so the response of, to the non Jews are you can look at God. Bila Hamavet Lanetzach. I'm going to remove that threat of death of trying to come too close to God. I'm removing it forever. Oh, so Netzach means Hashem? Netzach mean Hashem? No, Netzach is, is forever. Oh, just like for uh, Eternity, right. Umacha Hashem elokim dima me'al kol panim. And God will wipe away, wipe away tears. Mm -hmm. There won't be any more mourning or troubles. V'cherpat amo yasir me'al kol ha'aretz. And the shame of the Jewish people will be removed. Why? Because if all the non-Jews, and I'm taking this approach, I have two, actually, both approaches, it works. If I take the approach of Rashi and Radak, well, all these nations are going to be destroyed. So when all, the, when all your enemies are destroyed, you're doing pretty good. The cherpa, the, the shame of the Jewish people will be removed. According to the Dat Mikra and Rav Schwab, what's happening here, and there's also Rav Hirsch takes the same approach, if I go ahead and the nations of the world accept God, and they're celebrating the acceptance of God, then the Jews are never going to be viewed any longer as a shameful people, as the as a lower people. Rather, we're going to be accepted as the Mamlechet Kohanim V'goy Kadosh. We're going to be accepted as who we are. We're no longer going to be downtrodden. Ki Hashem Diber. This is the will of God. This is the word of God. That's that piece. That's that uh, fascinating uh, description of the feast. Two different ways again negative, positive, the end of it will be good for us. Will it come out of the rest of the nations recognizing God? Will it come out of the rest of the nations being destroyed? We don't know. Two different ways of looking at the same piece, but ultimately the Jewish people will no longer be shamed. Now this is a famous pasuk. It's an independent pasuk, and it will be on that day. Miami, I was at Miami Boys Choir, the Toronto Boys, the Toronto Choir, whatever, you had this great song, Vayamar Bayomahu. This is our God. We have hoped for him and he will save us. This is God who we've hoped for. We're going to rejoice in his salvation. The Gemara in. Um, in Tanit, at the end of Masechet Tanit, and I think Lamed, Lamed Aleph, Lamed Aleph, I didn't write it down, but it's, it's all the way at the end of Masechet Tanit. The Gemara there says that what's happening here is notice the word Ze. Whenever I say the word Ze, for instance, classic case, Shemot Perik Yudbet Pasuk Bet, HaChodesh HaZeh Lachem Rosh Chodeshi. Okay. The Medrash says, God showed him, if I say Ze, it's like I'm pointing to something. This Right, so God showed him what it would look like. The same thing here, according to the Medrash, there at the end of Tanit, that all of the tzaddikim are going to form a circle around Hakadosh Baruch Hu. They're going to be dancing and they're going to be pointing to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem kivinu lo nagila They're pointing to God, identifying God as the salvation. Now, obviously, when is this going to happen? According to the Mari Kra, this happens on the day when God has removed the shame from us, when we have been able to rise to our potential and others notice it and the, the rest, we'll be able to say, God, you did this. We know where it's coming from and that's where the Pasuk is from. The last piece is from, is Pasuk, Yud, Yud Aleph and Yud Bet. And it's talking about Moab. Now, when it's talking about Moab, what's happening here is there's a question. Is it just 
Moab or is Moab, and this is the Rabinowitz in the Tatsofim says this, Moab is emblematic of all other nations. The reason we pick on Moab is, first of all, we had a relationship with Moab. Remember, Moab is an offspring of Lot, their family. Moab is a nation from which we remember David Amelech descendants. There's this relationship to Moab. Moab geographically is right next to Eretz Yisrael, and Moab was an enemy. So it starts out as follows, and it may, but it may just be Moab as well. When God's hand is going to come down on this mountain, now the Yad Hashem normally talks about power. When the power of God comes down, okay, according to the Mitzvah David, it's important to say coming down. Because when I have the Yad Hashem Nituya, when I have it outstretched, it's going to use the power. When I bring down the hand, that means I've ended the power, and that's where the Mitzvah David comes from. When Hashem rests or stops from destroying the non-Jews, okay, and he again is talking specifically around Yerushalayim, we can see around Yerushalayim being in the time of Chizkiah, around Yerushalayim could also be the time of Gog and Magog, and end of days prophecy as well. What's going to happen? V'nadosh Moav Tachtav. And Moav is going to be crushed under it, under this hand, Okay. Now, Nadosh, like we have the word dash. Dash is a threshing. It's a thresh. Okay, for those who don't remember what threshing is, because for some reason not all of us are farmers, when you take grain, you put it on the threshing floor, and you take a weight, which used to be a board, and the ox would take the weight around, and what it would do is it would crush the grain and so that ultimately you would then winnow it, which is Zoran. You would take it with pitchforks, you would throw it up in the air, and the chaff which is lighter than the grains themselves, would blow away in the wind, and what would fall down again are just the seeds. So dash is the process of crushing something, okay? And, and here Moab is going to be crushed. It will be crushed like straw inside the madmena. Now the madmena is um, Matbein, first of all, is like a pile, like a pile of straw. Matbein is not just straw, but it's Tevin is the straw, but the Matbein is Arimat Teva. Matmena probably, uh, and while they translate that as waste or dung, I think, uh, I don't know how the, how do the translations go? Refuse. Dung, dung hills, and how's it there? Refuse. Refuse, we're being nicer. I'd actually suggest that Matmena nowadays would probably call it a compost heap more than anything else that it is the place that it's going to be crushed to such an extent, it's going to be just considered waste. But the madmena is normally used, when it talks about dung heaps or, or what, that, that's used as fertilizer. So it's, to me, it sounds more like a compost heap. And at that point, when oh, that's how, the, the level of destruction of Moab, um, feras yadav bekirbo. Now, they're going to spread out their hands from, in themselves, from the, from from the from their midst. Now, spreading out their hands and the the, the imagery that that Yeshayahu uses, ka'asher yifares has has just like a swimmer uses does his hand strokes. Now, interesting interesting image, but what does it mean? So they're going to try according to the simple explanation that Mikra does it very nicely. They're going to try to like get their way out of, of this position, okay? It's going to look like they're swimming, almost trying to get themselves out of this mess. According to the Radak, no, it's God. Mufaras Yadav Bikirbo, God is going to put his hands on them. He, God is going to do this, okay? And he's going to get them, he spiel, and he will lower or humble Ga'avato, the pride of Moab, Im arbot yadav, with the cunning of his hands. Now, arbot, according to the Tzudat David, are the, the towers that, that they had built, which was a sign of their power and their strength. Arbot, however, the Dat Mikra can talk about, it says, actually, we look elsewhere in Tanakh, arbot you have as uh, manipulation, the deviousness that you find in, in Echa, you have that it could be the um, 
the joints of a person's hand is also referred to it. We're really not sure a hundred percent, but he's going to do this with God is God is going to demean them, lower them, humble them with the hand, and the hand is the hand is, is a symbol of power itself. And then we have the final pasuk, and the final pasuk is actually not hard to understand. Okay, it's really just a question of of looking at it. Umivtsar miskav chamotecha hesach hispil higiel aretz. The mivtsar, your fortifications that were very tall, the towering form, fortifications of your walls, chamotecha hesach will be brought. Hesach, I'm sorry, will be brought down like lishdachavot. Okay, it's going to be brought down. Hispil is going to be the me uh lowered is going to be humbled he ad afar and it will be brought down so much that all of the things you took great pride in moab your towering structures are going to be destroyed all the way down to the ground itself and so in this one parak what you have is you have those four different pieces it starts out with yeshayahu telling you this is god you're great then it goes and talks about the non-Jews. Then it flips back to the Jews for one pasuk on how we're going to look at what everything is happening and accept God. And then it does one more piece about the non-Jews. And this piece is talking specifically about humbling them, people who were so convinced of their power. And if we talk about Moab, and if we say it's specifically Moab as an example of others, we're talking about those nations, the, the final group who were right around Eretz Yisrael, who were continuing to oppress us, continuing to attack us. God is going to get them down as well. And with that, we're going to stop. Um, yeah, for one question. Yeah, one question. And sure you have you know, a quick answer to this. Notice the pronoun has switched in your days to your, from him, him, his, 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 it's, it's. It's called Komotecha. Yeah. Yours. Your, so it's as if he's directly addressing Moab, where he has not been. He was only talking about him in the he, the it. Now he's talking about them in you. You'll see. You're going to get your end. Interesting. Yeah. I, um... Because he opens up talking directly to a Spurko. Yeah. A Tara Mincha. So is he somehow describing the homotecha? Well, the, the, it is possible the homotecha is actually um, referring to the mitzar itself, just like you have the vrei kodshecha or your dvarim kodashim. It may not be the second person specifically to Moab in the same way, maybe talking to actually the walls themselves oh. that, were, that were being brought down. We don't know, but it is definitely it goes from a third to a second person. And when you go from a third to a second, it's there's more immediacy to it as well that, that's taking place, all this. Um, next uh, next week, there will not be class. The week after uh, Sunday, Hanukkah is okay in the morning? Okay, Sunday, Hanukkah, will will have class again. And uh, then the next couple of Sundays, we'll have off. Actually, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to make a suggestion. If everyone's okay, let, we'll take our four weeks. Okay. I'm going to skip Sunday of Hanukkah. I'm going to skip because I get back, I think, on Wednesday or Thursday, right before. We're going to, we're going to skip that. We're, so the next time we get together, we'll be somewhere in, uh, next time we get together, we'll be around uh, at the beginning of January. I think the first Sunday, first Sunday in January, we'll get together again. Okay. 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 And that's it. We'll stop right here. Yeah. Amen. And it should be